Hi everyone, um, my name is Matthias. Uh, the talk I'm giving today is a little bit different from what people usually talk about on NLP with friends. Um, colleagues of ours in the past, they, what, what they uh, talked about is an actual piece of research uh, that they publish or are going to publish soon. Um, this one is a little bit different. Uh, it's not an actual piece of research that I published. Um, it's more uh, of a summary of my thoughts regarding progress in my research field. And it's mostly meant to stimulate uh, discussion. So I'll, I'll make sure we have plenty of time for discussion. So what this talk is about is uh, achieving genuine progress. And it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that I, I put this word genuine uh, in the title, uh, because in my opinion, it happens often that something seems like progress on the surface, but uh, in fact, it, it's not actually, it doesn't actually uh, improve um, uh, machine translation as a field. Um, but if I picture in my head uh, what genuine actual progress looks like in, a, in, in any field, basically, then uh, it would be something like this. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's not a steady accumulation of facts or you, 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 you can't say it's uh, a continuous expansion of the boundaries of knowledge, nothing like that. It's more like a series of ups and downs and, and there's progress and there's setbacks also. But what's interesting to me is in the regions where we do see actual progress, uh, what's happening there? What's driving, what's driving actual genu genuine progress? So that's what I'm after in this talk. That's what this talk is about. Uh, namely, what uh, are the drivers of this atom driver? Certainly, I would say the driver of Star Wars. Uh, what are the drivers of machine translation research? Uh, in my, my opinion, uh, two things that I think are, are worth, worthwhile to talk about. Uh, first, sound methodology and reproducible experiment is the second one. And what I'm going to do is uh, tell you about those one after the other. We'll start with sound methodology. And I should mention that this is about machine translation because that's the only field I really know well enough. But of course, I think most of this also applies in other fields, in your field of NLP um, as well. So let's start with sound methodology. Um, if I hear the word methodology, this triggers a specific story in my head, uh, namely that I've, I've had a professor in undergrad who would stand in front of the class and hold up a book which said methodology on the cover. And um, the way I've drawn it, unfortunately, it seems like that the book is about meth, which is not true. So it was, it's a book about methodology. And she, and the disturbing thing was that she was saying that, unfortunately, students nowadays don't have a clue about methodology. And this has stuck with me uh, since. It took me a long time to get over this feeling of not knowing what me methodology meant. But now I know, and of course, all of you uh, know as well, because you didn't have this professor. Uh, namely, I, I simply mean uh, asking the, of any piece of research, asking the question whether the conclusions are supported by the evidence, basically. So that's basically what I'm after, uh, if I use this term methodology. Um, I recently wrote, uh, published a series of blog posts about methodology for machine translation. Uh, it says evaluation here in the title, uh, but evaluation and uh, methodology that leads to actual progress, they are uh, very uh, closely connected in my mind uh, because evaluation is the, is the yardstick with which we measure progress. So I would say they are inextricably linked to each other. Uh, anyway, so uh, it's a series of blog posts with uh, tips and tricks, recommendations for how to do to get evaluation of empty uh, rights. And what I wanted to do in the first 
part of this talk is uh, talk you through three specific examples of recommendations that I'm, I'm giving in, in those blog posts. And the ones I, I decided to feature are uh, these ones, uh, first variance and multiple runs, then simulated versus realistic low resource uh, experiments, and then finally using the newest data set available. So those are the three I'm going to talk you through now. Uh, let's start with variance. So very often, of course, you, you know that what papers throw at you is tables like this, where people uh, have a baseline model, then they make some modification or they propose a different model. And you also get uh, uh, an evaluation result, like a blue score. And in this case, it seems like uh, adding more encoder layers gives a point to uh, increase in blue score. So now, does this, the evidence in this table supports the conclusion that adding encoder layers leads to better translation quality? Uh, I would say, no, it doesn't. Because uh, adding more encoder layers is not the only thing you uh, add to the baseline, unfortunately. In an ideal world, it would be, but in reality, uh, there's also random if effects that are at play because the, the, for instance, the model weights are initialized randomly and there's certain things in the training procedure that are also uh, random samples. For instance, the, the batches um, drop out, add so on and so on. So many things are due to randomness. So you have to take this into account when uh, reporting your, your results. And uh, one way to go about this is train several models of the same kind and then to, to see uh, uh, what the variance is in the outcomes that, that you get. And then one way to communicate this is by um, showing this variance in, in the table. Like here, I'm not, actually I'm showing standard deviation, not variance. Um, and now we would be in a position to say that no, it doesn't seem like adding more encoder layers uh, it is different from our baseline model in terms of translation quality. So first tip or first ingredient for sound methodology, think about uh, multiple, multiple runs and the variance. Uh, then on to the second thing, simulated versus realistic low resource uh, experiments. Uh, what many, uh, machine translation papers on low resource uh, data or with low resource experiments have in common is that they unfortunately simulate low resource settings. So what I mean by this um, is as follows. Uh, to explain what, what I'm showing here are two data sets that you could train a, a machine translation model on or do your experiments on. The one on the left is the Romanian English, and then there's also German Yiddish. So those are two data sets you could use to, to train your systems, to uh, report results, talk about in your paper. And let's imagine that we have 6,000 6K sentence pairs in the training set for each of those. Uh, now, what I'm claiming is, uh, not both of them are the same kind of low resource data set. So 6K sentence pairs is not much. So that's definitely on the low resource end. But um, the difference is that 6K sentence pairs for Romanian English is not actually all the Romanian English sentence pairs you can find on the web. It's just a small selection of much more. For, in, for instance, the WMT 16, uh, ShareTask had 400,000 uh, sentence pairs for Romanian English. And what people very often do is they take the 400,000 sentence pairs for Romanian English, they take a random sample to, to downsample the data set to 6,000, and then they run their experiments. To, to, um, and then they go on to make some claims about low resource data or low resource machine translation. And uh, for German Yiddish, uh, it's completely different because it seems like 6,000 sentence pairs is the total amount you can find on the internet in this, for this language pair. And uh, 
this is a problem because um, if you take a small sample from a larger corpus, then you can expect that uh, linguistic phenomena on all levels of linguistic organization will still be well distributed and well represented. Uh, so that's a, a, a difference uh, between the two. That's not the case for German Yiddish. Uh, um, also, actual uh, realistic law resource data sets, they very often come from, from one single domain only, and they, on top of that, they are more noisy than larger corpora. Um, so you can't claim that the, the results you obtained on a simulated law resource uh, in such a simulated law resource setting carries over to a re realistic law resource setting. That, that's the, main, the, the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, last, last tidbit from my blog post, blog posts, uh, using about using the newest data set available. Uh, here, the, the basic insight is that uh, machine, the machine translation community has an interesting fascination for uh, the WMT 14 uh, data sets, uh, more specifically, the English German and English French data sets from 2014. Um, so uh, you have to take my word for, for this, but uh, uh, there are very many papers that are published after 2014 that present experiments on uh, this WMT English German 2014 a data set I'm showing on the left here. Um, even though in, there are newer iterations of WMT that also have English German, uh, like the 2020 uh, version of WMT that have much more data. It has 10 times more data for this language pair. Plus there are hundreds of millions of uh, monolingual sentences for either uh, language. Um, so this begs the question why uh, why are people stuck in this time loop and are evaluating uh, training models on, on this data set? Uh, I don't really know. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up, um, so I, 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 I'm not opposed to nostalgia. Uh, that, that's not the reason I'm bringing this up. I think it's a serious problem. And uh, at least two reasons why this is a problem is, first of all, uh, in 2014, that was all the data there was for English German. And if you train a model on this, uh, then you, I think you, you could uh, make claims that uh, up about state of the art for this translation pair, for this language pair. Um, but now this uh, models trained on this data set stopped being state of the art a long time ago. Um, people continue to, to talk about this as if, if it were state of the art. And the second uh, more important problem uh, is that uh, collectively we are uh, tuning on this data set, which uh, machine learning 101, you should never actually do. I should never tune uh, a system on your test set, you should never peek at the test set uh, or take multiple shots. But collectively, over the years, we, we've taken so many shots at this data set, tried to find a model that does well on this 2014 test set, that basically any result you produce nowadays is quite meaningless, I have to say. So those are the, the, the three. Uh, Matthias, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, so if you go back to the previous slide, so I get some of your point, but not all of them. So like, first of all, the amount of data in the 2020 is much larger, as you said. So some people just don't have the computation uh, means to run on, to train models on 50 million uh, sentences. And I think it's fine. And the other thing is that when you want to evaluate against other papers or other models, you uh, sometimes it's not, or oh, it's really hard to, uh, or again, you don't have the resources to like run all the other models on the newer data sets that, well, uh, that are now available. So I right. can see several reasons why you would 
uh, test and train on previous data sets. I agree that the, the overfitting is, uh, is an issue. Uh, so like maybe there is a middle ground here that every once in a while you should change, but right, I wouldn't right. say okay. that you, every new data set you want to jump on that. Right, let me see if I can remember all of your questions. Um, and, and sorry that I'm facing away from my camera. I have a different screen where I see Zoom. So that, that's why I'm not trying to be impolite. Um, so, and I, um, so first of all, you said that there are people that don't have the resources to train models on the largest data set available. Uh, that's not a problem, but um, you have to, uh, oh, uh, I think I just moved my mouse. Um, only thing I'm saying is that uh, your claims or your conclusions need to be supported by the evidence that your experiment produces. That's all I'm saying. So if you train on a data set from 2014 that is quite small by today's standards, your conclusion cannot possibly be about state-of-the-art models. So that's all I'm saying. You have to, um, if, if you're... So, so it depends like what, what conclusion you make. So yes, exactly. You can say you <laughs> state-of-the-art, but you're state-of-the-art when you run on this amount of data from this time. Uh, yeah, that's, that's in my mind, that's not how state-of-the-art works. You can't say state-of-the-art from 10 years ago because state-of-the-art has a time, uh, I would say, it's, it's, it's about uh, right now. Um, but uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, I'm saying that the conclusion... Sure I agree. Like, it, it really depends what you, like, on what you want to measure, right? Exactly, exactly. I'm saying that those two things, what you want to measure and what you want to claim afterwards, they, this needs to be aligned. Um, and uh, sorry, if I can move on to, to the second question uh, you had about uh, wanting to compare to previous work that had results on this data set. Um, I have a separate blog post about exactly this um, with, with an um, argument that, is, that is, uh, has much better structure than the answer I'm giving just now. But basically I would say that uh, the necessity to compare to previous work doesn't justify breaking one of the most important rule of machine learning, which is you shouldn't tune on your test set. I think that uh, you can, uh, as an auxiliary experiment, for instance, compare uh, to older work and train a model on this data set. But I, I don't think this should be front and center of a, of a paper that uh, comes out uh, this year. And I, I don't think it, I don't think it actually justifies uh, training a model on this data only. But you can say that you tune on the new test set as much as you tune on the old test set. Uh, no, no, because I, what I'm saying is that a, a, everybody in the community all researchers taken together, they collectively tune on the test set because so many people had a goal at finding a model that would do well on this test set. That, that, that is what I'm saying. And the longer that a, day, a test set exists, uh, the more people will have had a chance or taken a shot at, at, at finding a model that works well. And uh, eventually um, I think uh, th uh, we are bound to find a model which, which is overfitted uh, in a sense to this test set. Ah, yeah, I agree. So like now in 2021, I agree that we shouldn't test on 2014, but not necessarily on 2021, but maybe also 2018 is fine. Oh uh, yeah, that would be more fine. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a gradual, it's a gradual thing. Um, I, I would say that the, the so like the, 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 the value the uh, data set available. I would so say I agree, that, like I, I don't know where to put the, the line exactly. But, uh, you can't, uh, you can't put a line anywhere. Uh, it's a gradual thing, but, but um, I would say that 
the newer a test set is, the lower the chances that you are uh, overfitting to this test set or tuning towards this test set, which would mean that your experiment is basically meaningless. Right. Because, because our actual goal is to further science or to, to like improve machine translation as a science. And um, we know that, that it's, uh, it's meaningless to, to uh, find a model which does well on, on just one test set only. Right, so, so uh, Jan, I, I hope I can uh, move on now. I'm sorry to, to cut you off if you wanted to add some more. But as I said, my talks uh, tend to be rather controversial and I, uh, very often I, I um, uh, don't get to the end of my, of my slides. So, but, but Jan, I, please uh, feel free to bring this up again uh, in the discussion part. Uh, right, so... Um, so, by the way, Jan, I, thanks for all those, those great questions. I think uh, those are legitimate uh, and reasonable questions. Um, just to summarize what I just said, or the, the things I uh, talked to you through from my blog posts, uh, first bit was about variance in multiple runs, and then uh, simulated versus realistic low resource data sets, and then about using the newest uh, data sets available. And uh, as I said, there's more blog posts uh, that you could uh, read. For instance, one about that is called uh, resisting the urge to use old data sets uh, to compare to older works, I think. Uh, right. Um, after writing those blog posts, it, it occurred to me that one other important driver of actual progress, in my opinion, is making reproducible experiments. So not only ones that are methodologically sound, also ones that are actually reproducible. And uh, I know I'm stating the obvious here, and I know everyone has the same experience that reproducing papers is, is hard. I, I, really, I realized this pretty soon after I started my PhD that, that uh, this is actually hard. And instead of uh, telling the story of uh, my uh, failures with this. I, uh, I'm just giving you two testimonies from the community. One from Martin Junchis Domant, who is uh, with Microsoft Translator. Uh, he's currently learning Russian. That's why his name is <laughs> in Cyrillic. Um, and he's saying, basically from his experience or in his view, hardly anything in MT seems to be re reproducible on scale. And the time wasted by people trying to reproduce uh, existing works is enormous. Um, I'm not commenting this right now uh, until I've shown you the second testimony. Uh, it's from Alp Öktem. He is with Translators Without Borders. If you don't know this initiative, it's, it's, it's amazing work that they are doing. They are organizing translation for uh, situations of humanitarian crisis uh, to work alongside, for instance, doctors without borders. I hope that's correct, Alp. Uh, you have to correct me afterwards, uh, if not. So uh, he was telling me that uh, for, for them, it's, it's exceedingly difficult to, to reproduce works, especially ones on low resource MT and take them to the real world or find some real world value for those works in actual systems for translations, translators without borders. Um, so I guess those two testimonies, they just go to show that everyone is in the same boat. Everyone has the same problems with, with reproducibility. But the question is why? Why is something hard to reproduce? And uh, not only is reproducing the papers themselves hard, it's also hard to tell why they are not reproducible. Because on the one hand, uh, it could be because uh, there's a serious bug in my re-implementation of an existing work. That could be why it's not reproducible. It could also be that um, uh, the method doesn't generalize well, and I, I use a different data set to test the method on. Or it could be that actually uh, those results in a specific paper are in fact not reproducible. So that's always an option. <laughs> so those are different reasons. And it, it's a huge conundrum that, that I uh, 
I don't have a solution to, but I think that at least uh, that there's an, at least an easy way to rule out the bug in my re-implementation reason for non-reproducibility. Um, and the solution is basically publish your code. So that's, uh, that's, that's what I, I want to talk about um, in, in the second part. Um, I know that uh, many people do uh, release their code publish their code nowadays, which is a good thing, but even if they do uh, release the code, then um, I think uh, um, I, I have to to, uh, to say something about this or um, have um, something to nitpick about this. Um, but first, not everybody is releasing code. Mm, I think that's the case for all of NLP. Not everybody, not every paper comes with code and but the question is, why not? Uh, because, oh, first of all, uh, here is a preview of the three things I want to briefly highlight here in this second part. First of all, sharing code is easy. And then I'll talk about promising to release code and then about two types of code releases. One of them I call library code and the other I call holistic code. Um, so let me now let me talk about the first one, the fact that sharing code is easy. Uh, in fact, it's it's so easy sharing code and data and models uh, like is so easy that there is literally no, nothing on the planet that is easier to share than our subject of study, which is code, data, and models. And here are some comparisons to uh, other people. So think about the poor fellows that, that study the digestive system of whales, for instance, or the, or uh, let's say the universe. So they, they they clearly are at a disadvantage here, and it's it's uh, there's a, a limit to how reproducible uh, uh, those experiments of those people can be. Um, but uh, that's not the case for us, because sharing code is really easy compared to uh, every other subject. Uh, every other scientific field. Uh, so that's it for sharing code is easy. Um, now, I know that, that you, you probably most of you are really releasing your, your code. So, um, or uh, um, let's say uh, many papers nowadays that are submitted anonymously, at least a promise to release code. And, and that's another difference I would make. It's the second thing I want to highlight. Um, it's common for anonymous submissions to promise that the code will be released, but it, it's worth noting that that's not the same as actually uh, then um, go on to re release the code. And um, to uh, as uh, anecdotal, anecdotal evidence for this, um, I have uh, another tweet here from Rick van North from the University of Groningen. And I'll give you a few seconds to just read the tweet. Right, so uh, now that you've you've read it, you you uh, you see that that this is uh, anecdotal evidence for or is it's making a case that promising to release code is not the same as actually uh, releasing code, um, and uh, but but that's the the way that that our uh, reviewing system and the, 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 the current method to publish papers works at the moment. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of unhappy with the fact that people uh, get, get uh, to boost their reviews by saying that they would release the code but then go on to never re uh, release the code. So I, I think that that's something to be uh, addressed in, in the future. That, that's why I'm, I'm highlighting it. And then uh, last thing uh, I want to mention is um, that 
code comes in different shapes or code releases are very different between different, uh, different papers. Um, there are code releases that go with papers that I call library code, um, which basically release an implementation of the method or of the, the model architecture itself that you could use as a building block to reproduce the results shown in the paper. Um, what holistic code, what I call holistic code, by the way, don't think too much about the names for those library and holistic, I just came up with them. Um, so what holistic code would do is it would give you all the scripts that are necessary to reproduce the, the results reported in the paper from scratch. And what I have in mind are things like downloading the, uh, all the dependencies, creating a virtual environment, downloading the data, pre-processing the data, training the models, evaluating the models, generating the uh, tables and figures that you show in the paper. So that's, that's what, what I have in mind. And I think that holistic code is wildly uh, superior to library code when it comes to uh, serving this purpose of, of um, improving uh, reproducibility. Uh, now, um, let me show you two examples. Um, one example of uh, bad library code and one example of uh, better, uh, vastly superior uh, holistic code. And since I don't want to pick on anyone uh, in the community, uh, I decided to pick on myself and unfortunately on uh, also on my uh, co-authors uh, because that's a hazard of working with other people you can't uh, dunk on yourself in isolation but uh, to be fair to my co-authors uh, that's all on me so because i wrote this code so um, please don't uh, uh, email them uh, email them about this um, so that's a paper from 2018 and we do release code, we, we do publish code. There's a URL here you can follow, um, but you will notice it's just a jumble of scripts. Uh, there's not really any way to, to know what I ran in what, in what order. And uh, at this point, not even I could tell you how to arrive at the results that we show in the paper. And I, I have to emphasize that I don't mean that this is a bad paper. I think that it's, uh, a relatively useful paper the, uh, and a useful resource that people uh, successfully used uh, since it was released. I just mean that the code is bad. And uh, uh, now for a different example uh, of a good paper with good code. Now really here I can, uh, of course, take anyone from the community. Um, Here's an example that I'm particularly fond of. It's uh, the description of a system submitted to the WMG16 shared task from Edinburgh by Rico Senrich and colleagues. And also comes with a, a code release. And what's uh, interesting about this is that it's uh, what I call a holistic code release. It, it tells you, gives you all the scripts, all the shell scripts that uh, Rico Barry and Alexandra used to, uh, to uh, pre-process the data, to train the models and to evaluate the models. So this is very different from my jumble of scripts th that I published. And the reason I uh, decided to feature this specific example, uh, because there are many other examples of good code is that in my opinion, uh, this uh, repository um, helped very many people to uh, learn the ropes of machine translation, to get started with, with their own systems. I think this uh, uh, Rico has single-handedly jump-started the careers of many people in machine translation with this. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm just, uh, well, it's just a claim. I'm, I'm just claiming that um, the fact that he released the code for this in this, in this way uh, was, uh, was the main reason why uh, why this worked so well, I helped uh, so many people. Um, and so this one, it's, it's close to, to the ideal uh, code base I have in mind, but it's not perfect either. So what I have in mind is actually 
uh, a single script to do everything that you report or show in the paper. As I said, this has to be everything from setting up the environment, installing the libraries, training the models, evaluating. It, it should be, ideally, it should be everything. Um, and recently, I uh, adopted a style of working or a, a style of doing experiments that, ex that does exactly this. And in an, in an upcoming paper, uh, I will have code, code that works exactly like this, that does everything for you automatically shows you exactly what I did, how I did the experiments. Right, so those, that's all I wanted to say about uh, reproducibility and uh, imp about improving reproducibility by uh, publishing code. And now we talked about both of those drivers of, uh, of actual progress. And uh, now we are running a bit already uh, late, but since we, we had some discussion in between, I'll take the liberty to, to finish. Anyway, um, as an afterthought to everything I've said, um, I think it's worthwhile to also think about why. Uh, why are there papers with questionable methodology and without uh, uh, code in the best possible state you, you could imagine? And of course, we are assuming good faith. So uh, researchers are well in intention they're, they're uh, bona fide actors in this game it's not like they 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 uh, uh, intend to use questionable methodology for instance um and i think this comes down to the incentives uh to to structural in incentives that uh that are mis misaligned with, with the with, with the overall goal of achieving progress and so there's there's a lot of research also from other fields about this, and they're usually called misaligned structural incentives. And as an afterthought, as I was saying, I wanted to give you one example of such a, a misaligned misaligned incentive. Uh, the incentive is uh, here on the left: researchers rewarded for increased number of publications. I think that's true for NLP. I think researchers feel like they are re rewarded for more publications. And there's always an intended effect and an actual effect of, uh, of such incentives. And uh, the, the intended effect is among other things to improve productivity, uh, to, to give funding bodies a, a means to, to evaluate people also. But what it actually does is it uh, encourages incremental papers, uh, questionable methodology maybe, and uh, increase in, in false discovery rates, which means something like uh, non-reproducible results. So uh, that's what I'm thinking about currently uh, as an afterthought. Right, takeaways. Um, what can you do uh, as an individual? Uh, you can, in my opinion, you can lead by example. So you can have high standards for yourself, methodology-wise. Uh, you can foster an environment where it's okay to question other people's uh, work or methodology in a constructive manner. Uh, you can publish code, of course. Uh, and there's also things that the community as a whole could do. Uh, and namely, uh, they, what they could do is create new incentives that are more aligned with the overall goal of uh, improving machine translation or NLP as a whole. Um, here are some ideas. Um, I don't think I'll, I'll read them out now. It's just a, a couple of ideas of my own, but uh, there's plenty of space for your ideas as well. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and uh, comments on, on this topic. Um, thanks for listening while, while you're thinking of Questions here is a, a photoshopped picture with an Easter egg for you to enjoy. Thank you.